Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is George Selgin. George is the director of the Cato Institute for Monetary and Financial Alternatives and is a previous guest of the podcast. George has recently written on and testified before Congress about the future path of the Fed's balance sheet and how to properly do interest rates on excess reserves. George, welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, David. It's always a pleasure. Oh, it's great to have you, Juan. You are now the most frequent guest of Macro Musings. This is your third time on the show. This is my third, yes. Yep, so welcome back. Thank you. And you've been doing a lot of work, as I mentioned, on you know, the direction of the Fed's balance sheet, and we want to get into that. So let's talk about what is the Fed doing. The Fed seems to have set the speed of reduction, but not its final destination. So tell us about that. Well, I, I've called uh, what the Fed's doing Operation Snail. I'm trying <laughs> to remember now what the opera- what the acronym stood for. I think it's a stall. Uh, in, as it was being originally planned, uh, it, it stood for stall now and inch along la- later. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they're now uh, inching along. Uh, I don't have uh, too much to say by way of criticism of the general strategy of going slowly, though it is pretty slow. Uh, they could certainly shrink their balance sheet faster. My my big concern is that uh, this this aspect of the, this policy normalization, to call it that, isn't part of a more complete normalization process. The end result of which would would be, uh, if I had my Brothers, a return to a corridor type operating system where interest on reserves is, can be there, but it's it's below the prevailing uh, short term interest rates. Yeah, so the Fed has been very clear about the amount of reduction. Uh, just to be specific, they said they will reduce their treasury holdings by six billion per month, three month intervals, and they'll slowly increase that until his thirty billion, and then mm-hmm. with GSCs. The agency securities four billion per month until it hits a twenty billion cap, and so we'll keep doing that. And the question is, how small will the reserve portion of the monetary base get? So we know over time the currency portion is growing as the size of the economy grows, and that will probably, be, no matter what happens, that will be the largest portion of the monetary base in the future. But the question is, how small will the bank reserve portion of the monetary base become? And I have in front of me here a note done by some Federal Reserve staffers at the Board of Governors, and they have two scenarios, and they they even say, you know, it's very unclear what the final, you know, outcome will be, but they have it at either $100 billion, and that would be like the small scenario where they've they got few reserves or as much as um, a couple trillion or one to two trillion. Uh, so there's a big wide range there. Yeah, it is not going down to 100 billion. It, it's it's it. I'd be surprised if it went down to uh, uh, anything less than two trillion. Uh, uh, the the uh, the total size of the Fed's balance sheet. My best guess is it'll never get smaller than three trillion if they keep on with this plan. At which after which it'll it'll rise uh, according to the rate of roughly the rate of growth of currency demand. Uh, and uh, and the reason it's not going to get any smaller is twofold. First, most importantly, no matter what else may be true, the Fed has now come uh, come out and, and said, Yellen has said, others have said, that uh, they are determined to keep a floor system. And you can't have a floor system without a large quantity of uh, excess reserves in the system. You can't go back to $100 uh, uh, billion, uh, in reserves uh, unless you're going to go back to an old uh, corridor system, which is what I wish they'd do, but they have indicated no intent of doing that. So their normal is a new normal (laughs) that that involves keeping a floor system where the chief instrument of monetary control is the interest rate paid on banks' excess reserves. Uh, But the other reason why uh, they won't go below uh, uh, a fairly large quantity of uh, reserves is that... uh, uh, I, if they have any ty- if they have any kind of crisis again, and we'll eventually have another crisis because we haven't done much in the way of things that could uh, prevent that from happening, uh, despite Dodd Frank. If we ever have another 
a crisis involving a surge in a demand for liquidity. Uh, it, it, my belief is uh, that uh, there'll be more quantitative easing for the same reason we resorted to it during the last crisis, which is once you have interest, an interest floor in place, uh, then uh, and you don't want to move move it much lower, that uh, you 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 inevitably have to create vast quantities of reserves to get very small stimulus effects, which is what happened last time. For that reason, I've started to uh, refer to. Uh, 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 Powell is the six trillion dollar man because I think there's a good chance <laughs> we, we go we, instead of going down to two trillion, we end up at six trillion if anything really goes wrong in in under his term. Uh, but in any event, uh, I, uh, I I don't see any reason, real probability that we'll get much below three trillion dollars in reserve in a uh, Fed balance sheet. So the Fed has been explicit. I, I thought they were still open to what the final choice will be. They, I know there's been some who have expressed a preference for a floor, but I thought that was still an open question. I wish it were. Maybe it is. I hope it is. I think it isn't. <laughs> okay. Well, I know we interviewed Neil Kashkari, and he seemed like it was an open question, but he was leaning towards a floor system. I, I do think the default position is to stick with the floor system. So if you want to go otherwise, it's up to people like George Selgin to, to convince to, them. Yeah, uh, no, there'll be a fight to 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 get rid of the floor system. I think the board is set on it, uh, uh, whereas uh, there may be some members of the FOMC who aren't. But uh, the board, of course, uh, they have the they hold the majority in mm -hmm. uh, in these matters, um, and uh, uh, quite apart from the fact that it's the board that that actually sets interest on reserves, therefore can set it so as to maintain a floor system. Uh, but um, but uh, I, I, my, my uh, reading of things is that uh, unless somebody really, really pushes them to do otherwise, we're going to be stuck in, in this floor system and we'll, we'll, we'll probably even be foolish enough to keep it when the ne next crisis breaks out. Well, you raised an interesting point there about the legality of interest nexus reserves. We'll come back to that. There's several issues there. But just to flesh out this idea that there's a difference between a floor and a corridor system, why don't you explain to our listeners what that, that means? Well, um, a corridor system uh, is what we had a version of before the crisis here in the United States and what many countries uh, have still today. Most, most, most operating systems, uh, central bank operating systems are some kind of corridor. And in, in that system, you have a, a, a federal funds market, a market for interbank uh, overnight uh, lending of reserve balances that is a, a, a is a is a free market in a sense it's an active market banks don't have on in general excess reserves on hand some may occasionally and some others are short and so they're trading actively on this market to make the best use of of uh, available reserves but they're certainly not all sitting or most of them are not sitting on vast excess reserves uh, and uh, monetary policy in that system is uh, affected uh, by uh, through open market operations uh, designed to make the market determined uh, federal funds rate uh, reach a certain target level so if it's if you if it seems to be uh, too getting too high uh, the the instructions to the uh, open market uh, desk or to uh, uh, sell uh, securities and reduce uh, available reserves to bring that Fed funds rate down. If it's uh, if the effective funds rate is below target, they can do the opposite. Of course, um, uh, a lot of the movements in the uh, open market, uh, a lot of open market operations are, are meant to head off uh, uh, movements away from target, and uh, and then of course the target can be changed to to. Uh, Make adjustments in the policy stance, or to uh, make it more consistent with prevailing uh, market conditions that have changed. So that was the old monetary policy uh, That's the arrangement. Corridor system. That's a corridor. Now okay. our corridor was a so-called asymmetric corridor, where the bottom of the corridor, the, the mm. low end, was a zero interest rate on excess reserves, and the the upper end is as it usually is uh, the uh, di the discount rate, the Fed's discount rate, but. The effective federal funds rate was always in between. And of course, uh, with the zero interest on excess reserves, uh, particularly before the crisis, 
uh, that meant that uh, reserves continued to have an opportunity cost, right? It, it's, mm -hmm. it's generally speaking, banks had no incentive to accumulate excess reserves, which is why if the Fed created more of them with the open market purchases, say, it could count on the banks to put those to use by by uh, disposing of them in the in the reserve market initially in the overnight market, but ultimately uh, d d they would in build their balance sheets, their portfolios in, in other directions as well. And uh, so that's the old operating system. In more generic corridor systems, the most common form of which is a symmetric corridor, uh, you have uh, uh, a lower bound that may be a positive interest rate on excess reserves. So there's no inconsistency between paying interest on reserves or excess reserves and having a corridor system. That's perfectly possible. And then the upper end would be a discount rate where the target rate was exactly halfway between those two bounds. And that's quite a common arrangement too. So the difference between a, a floor system, which is what we have now, and a corridor system is not whether or not interest is paid on reserves. It's whether the target policy rate is equal to more or less the the, uh, the administered interest rate on reserves or whether it's something else, whether it's above that rate. Okay. And some things that come up when we talk about this difference between a corridor system and a floor system, one is this term that you often read people associate with these two different systems, and that is reserve scarcity. So you often hear people talk about reserve scarcity with a corridor system and then reserve abundance with a floor system. But you've written many times that's incorrect. Well, it's not the best terminology, I put it this way. It's okay. certainly true that in a floor system, you have a large holdings of reserves. And in the U.S. context, excess reserves, because we have a distinction between minimal required reserves and yes. reserves that are held uh, voluntarily. It's true that there are a lot more reserves being held and a lot more excess reserves. But, um, but in a sense, in a very fundamental sense, reserves are just as scarce uh, in, a, in a floor system because the, the reason banks are holding more reserves is because you've encouraged them to hold more. You've increased the quantity of reserves demanded by uh, a, a doing away with, largely doing away with the opportunity cost of reserve holding. You're making reserves more attractive, so the demand for them goes up. But uh, that's the same to say that uh, if you uh, if you make any good more attractive, other things equal, you make the demand go mm -hmm. up. But we don't say that the good has become more scarce in that sense. Right. We say that it's got a it's got a there's a new demand, there's a new price, as it were. And so, uh, um, but uh, uh, but but it is true that on the floor system, banks don't go around fine-tuning their reserves and getting them overnight when they need to and and and, and because they're not they're not uh, for the most part ever uh finding themselves short because they're so happy to hold plenty uh, uh of reserves uh, to have plenty on hand where those reserves are are now as attractive as as uh, as other short-term assets that would usually uh, outside of a floor system would have been judged more attractive than reserves yeah, so the I guess the point I want to stress here is reserve scarcity is not about the absolute quantity of reserves, whether you have a lot or you've got you've got few. It's it's the supply relative to the demand. So you could have a lot of reserves like we have today, but if you shift that demand curve out um, sufficiently, you can still have relative scarcity of reserves, even if you've got a bunch of them. Indeed, I would I would put it another way to put it is that um, what really ultimately creates a floor system isn't the nominal stock of reserves that's put out there. For example, we created trillions of additional mm -hmm. reserves during uh, the period when our floor system existed. It is whether uh, banks. Are uh, have a, a, a an exceptionally high demand for reserves, and so our floor system, for example, predated uh, uh, quantitative easing. We put the floor system in on, on October uh, two thousand eight, 
and we put interest on reserves in, and it quickly became a floor system. This is before most of the reserve creation took place. And uh, because we had uh, eliminated the opportunity cost of reserve holding, as the quantity of reserves grew thereafter, the, 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 the expansion of total reserves was reflected in a like increase in excess reserves because the demand for reserves was growing thanks to interest on reserves. So let's look at what this boils down to. It wasn't the creation of reserves that created that, that, that was essential to having a floor system. It was the establishment of return on reserves that made reserve holding more desirable. That came first. That's what gives you the floor. Then, of course, the more reserves you put in, the more of an ex- larger the excess reserve cushion is. But as long as banks find reserve holding more desirable than other kinds of lending, you could just have a sufficiently high IOER rate, uh, interest on excess reserves rate, wait a while, and eventually you'll have banks holding plenty of excess reserves, even if you don't change the nominal quantity. Yep. Yeah. So again, we need to be more careful when we say reserve scarcity and associate with a particular system. Also, just a couple of points to reiterate that you mentioned, there are many central banks around the world and most of them use a corridor system. In fact, you know, Canada is a good example. Canada temporarily had a floor system, then it went to a corridor system. The ECB has a corridor system. So the Fed is kind of unique in the fact that it's still sticking with a floor system, right? Uh, and the Bank of New Zealand, I believe. Okay, Bank of New Zealand too. Yeah. But those are the only um, two, the advanced economy central banks. I- don't want to bet on it, <laughs> but I think that's right. Yeah, I think right. I think that's right. Most yeah, most central I, I, banks, unless some, unless some central bank somewhere I haven't paid any attention to has gone to a <laughs> okay. A majority system. of central banks, absolutely, are, yeah, that you know have introduced some kind of you know interest and excess reserve type rate have moved toward a quarter system. And I guess this begs the question: if a floor system is so awesome, why have most central banks gravitated toward a corridor system? There's got to be some answer, some some insight in that experience. Well, David, you know my answer is I don't think a floor system is very awesome, and I'd like to I'd like right. I'd like to think that some of these other central banks just happen to take my my perspective on all this. I mean, we are a peculiar system. Uh, remember, we're also one of the only central banks that have persisted in paying uh, positive interest on reserves while many were moving towards negative interest rates or at least trying to do what they could yeah. in that direction. So so we have a peculiar uh, honor of having the only central bank that was determined by Hooker by Crook to raise interest uh, policy rates uh, uh, during the crisis, that is, interest rate on reserves to, uh, to higher levels than had ever been seen before the crisis, which sounds a little counterintuitive, and the only one that has... Uh, 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 not only created a floor system in the process, but has obstinately clung to that floor system, which uh, the technocrats of the Fed are now enamored with because they say it gives them more flexibility. And uh, I'd like to say something about this argument sure. because what they're really saying is that the flexibility consists of the fact that now you have two independent instruments you have uh, the interest rate on reserves. I'm not talking about the lower lower bound of the. It's the subfloor that's the overnight repo rate. We could talk about that, but it's a it's a kind of a sideshow. Let's just pretend we don't have a leaky floor, and and so it's all about the interest rate on excess reserves, which is really the the the, the star of the show anyway. Um, uh, the 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 uh, uh, the fact is that you've You've created this. You've created this regime, and uh, their claim is now we can set the policy rate, which is interest rate on excess reserves, anywhere we want it, to, where anywhere we want it to be, and we don't have to change the quantity of reserves to do that. We don't have to engage in open market operations. We don't have to change the Fed's balance sheet. Whereas under the old corridor system, as I mentioned, you, you're, the way you adjust. Uh, the policy rate, the way you keep your rate, on t- uh, uh, you keep your target is through open market I- operations. Now, now you have a separate parameter. This is the size of the balance sheet. So you can freely choose what your policy rate is. That's the IOER rate. And you can have whatever balance sheet you want. You have it big or smaller, you know, within limits. And, uh, and it's true. 
you, you now have two free parameters, as you if, if you like, instead of one. Because well, there's a great paper that has the title "Divorcing Money yeah, from Monetary, from monetary policy, policy," which the authors of that paper consider a great accomplishment, and I consider a great disaster. <laughs> but in any event, uh, let me make an analogy. Right? You have an automobile. Now, in an automobile, you have a steering wheel. You can turn the steering wheel left. You can turn it right. You also have a, a throttle or, or a gas pedal, which you can you can push on it more or less. The problem is when you're driving a, a car, usually, you really have to m coordinate where how you turn the wheel, particularly how f sharply you turn it and how fast you're going. You know, sharp turns with your foot all the way on the gas is asking for trouble. Right, right. What if you could turn the steering wheel any way you wanted it with the throttle as hard as you wanted it at any time and you didn't have to worry about coordinating those things? That would be a great accomplishment. I have a car, car where you've got these two <laughs> instruments that are totally, you know, disentangled from each other and you've got a lot more possible combinations of them you can achieve. It's great. Can you do that? The answer is you can. You can. Put it in neutral. <laughs> you can sit in your driveway and do all the combinations of the gas pedal and the, and the steering wheel that you like. All right. What has this got to do with monetary policy? Well, what did we do in 2008? We put it in neutral. We put the transmission mechanism in neutral. And then the Fed stepped on the gas, could step on the gas all it wanted. It didn't have to worry about its, in, its policy rate target because now that's, that's controlled by interest on excess reserves, right? That was the whole point. The hitch is you don't go anywhere. And our quantitative easing, the Fed's large-scale asset purchases were like stepping on the gas in neutral. Banks didn't lend the reserves that came, came their way. They piled them up. You know, I don't want to stretch an analogy, but imagine gas spilling into the driveway. Uh, and uh, uh, but they re re they're, they're, the 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 uh, the banks aren't the money multiplier has been killed by interest on reserves, and so you're not you're not adding to broad money when credit creation or bank lending. Uh, when you're stepping on the reserve gas, right, reserve supply gas, the only way you're going to get anywhere, if you get anywhere at all, is going to be through some kind of our portfolio effect, portfolio balance, some subtle non-monetary uh, transmission mechanism. And if you ask me and a lot of people, you look at the empirical evidence, the, the stimulus effect of all that, those large-scale asset purchases, not the, not the interest rate effect, but the actual effect on spending, employment, all is pretty meager. That's the cost of, of having all this freedom that, that proponents of a floor system boast about. And by the way, another way to put this is a floor system is just an above zero liquidity trap. That's what it is. So you're, you're engineering deliberately a liquidity trap where you normally wouldn't be in one. Normally you wouldn't be in one until rates are at, market rates are at zero. But if you put an IOER rate above at, at a positive uh, level above zero IOER, IOER rate, what you've got is a liquidity trap right there. Well, that's interesting. So if you ask someone on the street or one of our listeners, probably not someone on the street, <laughs> but one of our listeners, um, liquidity trap, good or bad? They'd say bad. Then I had a second question. Well, why is it bad? And they'd say, well, interest rates are getting stuck at the zero lower bound. The neutral rate's falling beneath that. So there's a gap between the two. And what you're saying is that is exactly what happens with the floor system, that the um, administered rate is going to be persistently higher than the equilibrium, what the market rate is. And so no matter where you are, you're effectively creating a liquidity trap above that value. Well, you could – it's a knife edge. You could be – you could get it just right. You, the funny thing about a floor system and one of the bad things is you can maintain a floor system by having things too tight. But you can't by having them too loose because then the, the, the floor wants to uh, come apart because banks are finding uh, reserves no longer so tempting to hold. So you, you, cannot, you can only have the policy rates be so low. See, the IOER rate is low enough that banks find it tempting to use their reserves rather than sit on them. Then your floor system goes away. So if you ha if you consistently stay with a floor system, you you can't make re you can't make the interest rate on reserves whatever you want it to be. So by design, to have a floor system, 
you have to have that administrative inter- administrative interest rate above market rates to keep the floor system intact. It's right. It's not a floor system unless the reserves have a very low or practically non-existent opportunity cost uh, cost relative to uh, 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 other short-term assets. Okay, and, and just to be clear, what you're saying is a floor system would fall apart in this kind of scenario. Let's say the economy heats up. It starts growing really rapidly, high return on capital, investment returns go up. And so there's an increased demand for loans. So banks provide them. They need more reserves. They're utilize, They're turning these excess reserves into required reserves. Maybe currency demand is going up as well. And what you're saying is if, if the Fed just keeps interest on excess reserves at its current value, does nothing, then that, corridor, that floor system, poof, is gone. That's right. So, But what has actually happened is we've had recovery. We've had an increase in bank uh, activity, but the Fed has, in fact, kept raising the IOER rate and its companion Uh uh, in order to keep the floor system going. Well, I mean, that's one explanation, right? The other explanation is that they're raising the rate to meet their inflation target. The only problem with that explanation is they're not meeting their inflation target. So that that explanation doesn't work very well. Normally, you change policy rates to hit your target, right? But in this case, it doesn't seem to fit. But it does. The, the, the movements in the IOER rate seem to be consistent with a determination to make sure you keep your floor system in place, which if they'd left the IOER rate at 25 basis points or even at 100, <laughs> by now, the floor system would be coming apart because the uh, short-term rates – in, uh, other uh, market yes. short-term rates are high, and banks would not be tempted to sit on all these excess reserves if the IRER rate hadn't also been ratcheted up as much as it has. Well, I mean, based on your description of the floor system, another way I would think of saying this is the Fed's determined to not hit its inflation target. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I, I would say they're not. That's not their goal. <laughs> I know. I'm. I'm being a little but if jaded and cynical there, here. It's but. a. It's a. It's a situation where maintaining the floral system is not uh, consistent, consistent right. with okay. uh, uh, hitting the inflation Fair target, enough. and the Fed has chosen. Uh, I think, unfortunately, to uh, to make sure that they maintain the floor system. I want to be clear. I'm not you know, maligning their ins- their motives and stuff. In, fa- in fact, yeah, usually that's my job. <laughs> Just having fun here with you, George. <laughs> but maybe that, that does raise a question, though. Do you think the FOMC just hasn't uh, thought through this process? I mean, I don't think they're consciously undermining their own inflation target or consciously trying to slow things down on the margin. But the story you're telling me is that they are. So is it just a misunderstanding of the floor system? I think that's part of it. I really honestly think that the the, the people at the Fed uh, uh, are sold on the virtues of this system. I don't think they realize that uh, that what they've been doing is raising rates in a manner that's better for maintaining the system than for achieving the Fed's targets. Uh, We know from their pronouncements about inflation that they're deeply confused about it. At least that's what they tell us. And I'm I'm prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt. (laughs) It's a puzzle, a mystery, a conundrum. uh, Yeah. yeah, And and, um, and so for all these reasons, I really don't think that they are consciously uh, trading off uh, uh, hitting their target for the sake of a technocratic uh, a preference for a floor system, but they really do like having a floor system. They are convinced that it is a superior arrangement. Um, there are, by the way, some public choice reasons why a floor system is preferable. Churning uh, uh, large quantities of interest on reserves uh, has its uh, uh, advantages uh, Essentially, it boils down to the Fed having a larger budget that uh, defined as the money it doesn't send to the Treasury out of all the money it earns. And though it's true that it's handing all this extra uh, revenue over to the banks in interest payments on reserves, this is not necessarily a bad investment (laughs) for the Fed. (laughs) Right. Especially. (laughs) So uh, now I'm getting a little cynical, but still. Yes. Okay, and I want to just go back to the corridor system. Again, most countries have moved toward that. And also another point to stress about the corridor system, which you brought up earlier, is even if the Fed were to go to the corridor system, they could still keep interest on excess reserves. 
it would still, you know, address this implicit tax on reserves. You could still, you know, cover that. Absolutely. You would still have the interest rate control because you'd have interest on excess reserves, interest on excess reserves at the bottom, your discount rate at the top. You know, symmetric corridor system. So it would be it would be different than what we had before two thousand eight, and yet we would still have you know interest on excess reserves. Yeah, the, the way a corridor system works is that you've got these upper and lower bounds. You've got the discount rate, and you've got the lower bound below market interest on excess reserves. And what you're hoping will happen is that neither of those administered rates will ever be relevant, right? In a, yeah. in a perfect world, you're not going to go all the way down to whatever your opportunity cost. You're not going to be in a situation where uh, reserves uh, where the interbank rate is, rate is that low. That's probably a crisis. By the same token, you don't want to find banks borrowing at your high discount rate because that means trouble too. So you know, in a corridor system, these boundaries are things you don't want to touch. If you touch them, then okay, for a Something's little while, you, you might be at a floor, for example. But yeah. but you don't want to stay there the way Canada was there for just a little while. And it was very bad news at the time. And by the way, they got their, their sharpest deflation in, 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 in ever in modern uh, – uh, uh, in post-war history, uh, I believe. But anyway, uh, uh, it's a corridor system. You're usually trying not to use those boundaries. They're there, but – but policy isn't really about them. It's about open market operations and the market rate overnight, right? The, the, uh, the other thing, though, is that uh, as far as efficiency is concerned, generally speaking, uh, a corridor system can allow re reserves to be re uh, re remunerated enough to overcome the inefficiencies that, uh, that are uh, – uh, implicitly uh, appealed to and, and thinking about Friedman rules and all that. Let's remember that when the Fed originally got permission to pay interest on reserves, which was in the 2006 uh, 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 um, Financial Efficiency Something or Other Act, uh, there was no thought at the time of a floor, of a court, of a floor system. The idea was that they would be continuing to use open market operations. It would continue to have a corridor, but it would be a, a, a corridor with a positive interest on reserves floor. That's all. And, and the extensive purpose of that legislation was to eliminate the inefficiency of, of uh, reserve holding, particularly on, on required reserves by paying some interest on those. So you, you can do that without a, without a uh, floor system. Moreover, if you believe, as I do, that taking all the necessary uh, transaction costs and other things into account, the the interest rate on reserves that's required to achieve the Friedman rule or or, efficient, or general efficiency is not going to be uh, the same as interest rates on other uh, short-term assets uh, because of, of uh, various administration costs, etc. There's a paper that I uh, think is very good by uh, Kanzanieri and uh, a couple of co-authors, a recent paper with the title something like, uh, Should the Pet Fed Pay a Competitive Interest Rate on Reserves? And they look at things very carefully and come to the conclusion that the optimal, the optimal tax on bank reserves is 20 to 40 basis points, at least in their baseline huh. model, which means that, that, that according to that baseline study, um, and most of the other, uh, uh, tweaks on the model still yield uh, some tax, positive tax and reserves, there should be a gap. Uh, the, the interest rate on reserves should be 20 to 40 basis points lower than the corresponding uh, 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 overnight rate. Uh, so a market overnight rate. So so in that case, we're, we're paying banks too much on reserves. And I think that's generally going to be true when you maintain a floor system. You're, you're not being efficient. You're, you're making reserves too tempting, too desirable. So just to be clear, the Friedman rule properly understood would actually imply a corridor system, not a floor system. Um, I didn't quite say that. Okay, well, it seems uh, to be pointing that direction. But I think direction. that I implied it, and I think the implication is correct. Yeah. Because if you, in order to have a a, a a floor system, you really have to pay banks enough on reserves to make reserve reserves as or more attractive than uh, than the closest corresponding uh, a asset so in our present system we're paying we've been paying more interest on reserves than even three month treasury bills uh, uh, pay uh, uh, and um, and and it's completely 
cost free. It, it, it takes more effort for banks to buy treasury bills than for them to sit on reserves, which is just there. And, and just to be clear, the Friedman rule is about the opportunity cost of money, right? You yes, want to be careful right. about that. And, and yes. in this particular context, you know, a, a banking system. It's the opportunity cost, cost of holding, of of banks holding reserves. Right. And, and, uh, and so we don't want that cost to be too high, but we can make it too low too. And floor system makes it too low. Okay. You're, you're giving it. You're making. You're making reserves uh, ha- be not only uh, uh, not onerous to hold, but you're making them seem better assets than 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 other uh, short-term assets. And uh, and that's what you need to do if you want banks to actually sit on trillions of dollars worth of reserves. But that is not the. That is not consistent with a properly applied. Friedman rule, where we we want banks to be uh, not not holding inefficient amounts of reserves, but we still don't want them to hold oodles of them. So maybe to summarize, it seems that now we're paying banks too much relative to the Friedman rule for reserves, but maybe before 2008, we were paying too little? Oh, yeah. We, we certainly were paying them too little before 2008 when we were paying zero. Zero. And other rates were higher than they are now. So, so there was this opportunity cost. Oh, there was this implicit yeah. tax yeah. on banks for the reserves. Yeah. So, so uh, one way to sum that up is I, I, I would have been perfectly in favor of the 2006 uh, measure to give the Fed the authority to pay interest on reserves, assuming I didn't anticipate how they would abuse that right later. <laughs> uh, but I would have been opposed uh, and I was opposed to the 2008 acceleration of that power. Uh, to pay interest on reserves at exactly the wrong time <laughs> when uh, when the, 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 the point or let's remember why they did that they were making a lot of emergency loans and the Fed at that time was determined to keep its uh, policy rate which was still at that point determined with the usual mechanisms at what was then a 2% target so they were uh, – after Lehman's failed, they were going to be making vast increases in their balance sheet and additional emergency loans. They had uh, been tre- sterilizing their emergency loans by selling off treasuries from their balance sheets. That treasuries had come down to the point where they didn't want to sell anymore. So Bernanke and company asked for this uh, acceleration of the right to pay interest on reserves in order to be able to keep keep making these emergency loans but not have the reserves impinge on their interest rate target by being uh, dumped into the federal funds market by the banks that got hold of them. So the idea was to make reserves more attractive than federal funds and incidentally more attractive than a lot of things. So banks would just pile them on. And that was the purpose, the purpose. And at that time, they they weren't worried about making policy too tight. They were worried that it would be too loose. The problem is that they seem to be uh, not worried about making it too tight still. <laughs> and, and you know, when you put that mechanism in place, right, you put it in place in October 2003 because you're worried about inflation. 2003 they, or uh, 2008, pardon, because yeah. they were worried about inflation because they were worried about missing their target. In the meantime, the economy is just just going downhill, you know, uh, 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 just uh, circling the bowl, to put it crudely. <laughs> and then uh, they decide uh, at some point, of course, they've lowered their funds right now, but their target, but it doesn't mean much of anything. They decide, well, you know, maybe we need more stimulus after all. The, the inflation scare has finally gone away. Um, it's clear that what's needed is stimulus. And now they're getting ready to do large-scale asset purchases. In the meantime, they've left this thing in place that they put there to make sure that any reserve expansion doesn't lend, lead to any general increase in bank lending. Well, what's it going to do now? Same thing, right? So the odd thing is in October, they want to have interest on reserves so banks won't use extra reserves that come their way, won't use them to make loans, won't use them to put in the, in the marketplace. And, and then now they want a stimulus, but they leave that in place. They won't get rid of it. And uh, uh, as if they're stuck with it, but they're, they're not. They don't have to do this. And now they're going to create trillions of dollars of reserves, which are going to pile up. And, and, uh, and of course, the reason they create it works both ways. Right? We have to create trillions now because they're piling up. And they're piling up because we're paying interest on reserves. And you can show it's, it's, it's any, anybody who claims interest on a rate on reserves has nothing to do with the piling up. It's got some statistical fancy work to, 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 to do. Uh, so they, they rendered monetary policy impotent. 
at least in its, as far as the usual transmission mechanism is concerned. Then they created trillions of dollars in reserves as a way of trying to overcome the impotency of policy that was their own doing. And this is the system that they're calling a great technological breakthrough. Yes. So the Fed itself was clear that they were doing this to maintain control over monetary policy. They, Initially, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they foresaw the banking system turning those excess reserves into required reserves, maybe also into currency, and they wanted to prevent that from happening, at least initially. And they didn't want – but they were, the immediate concern was the Fed funds market, of course, because if the reserves are put into the Fed funds market, say you make emergency loans, banks get the reserves, right. and then they put it in the Fed funds market because they don't need it, that's going to undermine okay. – that's going to undermine the Fed funds target, which, of course, the Fed funds target was collapsing yeah, so, I mean, anyway. So. The, I mean, the irony of it is, of course – they introduced it at the very time the natural rate was falling. And, and just – I want to put some numbers on this, make this concrete. I looked this up before the show. So in October 15, 2008, right around when interest on, interest on excess reserves was introduced at 75 basis points, the one-month Treasury yield was 0.05 percent. So 70 basis points spread. And, and of course, the outlook was getting worse. Um, then October 24, interest on, interest on excess reserves goes up to 1.15. The one-month Treasury yield was 0.33, so a spread of 82 basis points. Then in from November 7th through December 15th, it goes to 1%, but the one-month Treasury yield was at 0. 0.05 for a 95 basis point spread. So in addition to all these other issues you're bringing up, it, where they were – putting it was much higher than the natural rate. Now, in fairness to the Fed, I, I do think there were some challenges because GDP wasn't reflecting the huge collapse in real time. I, I do think, on the other hand, there were asset prices that were clearly screaming, we're going over a cliff, break-evens, you know, other asset prices. So there were... And the inflation wasn't there. The only inflation which they were worried about from June on June to October is critical paper. They're worried about it. The only the only inflation is in the headline inflation, right. which they should not have, right. according yeah, to their absolutely. own understanding. Yeah, they should, should have not have been paying that much attention to that. They shouldn't have been worried about it. But the fact that they were acting as if they're still worried about it in October, uh, I think, is particularly uh, strange. Well, in September too. In September, sorry. <laughs> and yeah, that's it. In September, well, but, but, but October. Yeah, the August. I've looked at transcripts from both those meetings, even in August. There were a number of members who were saying that they felt it was more likely than mm-hmm. not yeah. they would be raising rates in the, at the September meeting. But by October 15th, when this device is put into effect, because it takes till the, the second, third week of October for the actual interest rates to begin, uh, by that time, by the time they're actually making sure banks aren't going to do anything with extra reserves that could ease monetary conditions, They have no reason to be not wanting to ease (laughs) monetary conditions. Well, you know, Ben Bernanke in his book says he regrets this decision too. And I think there are probably some people on the FOMC he had to work with that were – Oh, I I don't think he was the main (laughs) Yeah, in some ways I I feel bad. I've criticized the Bernanke Fed, but I think there's certain characters inside the Bernanke Fed that made life difficult for him. All right, well, let's move on to – the legality issues surrounding interest and excess reserve. You already touched on one part of it. There's two parts I want to go over. The first one is, you know, what's the intent of the law for interest and excess reserves? So, uh, the the uh, as I mentioned, the 2006 law, which in- initially uh, authorized the Fed to pay interest on reserves, was designed simply to to have the Fed. Uh, 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 close the, the the reduce the opportunity cost, but not to zero, of holding required reserves mainly. They really weren't concerned about excess reserves because they were contemplating a regime that would be the same as uh, what had been in place all along, where excess reserves are minor, minor. Nevertheless, they did give the power to pay interest on excess reserves as well. But the statute said that the interest rate on reserves, excess or uh, 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 required was, quote, not to exceed the general level of short-term interest rates, not to exceed the general. So it could be at that level, 
or it could be below that level, but it couldn't exceed them. So this is clearly uh, uh, contrary to a floor system's requirements. A floor system, you generally put the rate above so the banks are piling up reserves even even when they have the option of buying you know, three-month t- treasury or something. Ten-month treasury bills paid less, had less y- lower yield <laughs> for a considerable length of time after this measure went into effect than the interest on reserve. So anyway, uh, that was the spirit of the law. That that didn't change when they accelerated the date for implementing it. Didn't change. None of these rules changed. But what happened was the Fed just decided, uh, as the law allowed them to do, to interpret the statute. And they have they, they published their interpretation. And it turned out their interpretation listed a bunch of rates that for purposes of implementing the statute could be considered short-term market rates. And most of them were ter- long-term market rates. There's no overnight rates listed in the Fed's definition. Oh, that's of, how they justify it being so high. No, no, but they had a they had a they had a they had a uh, another ace up their sleeves. They also included on the list of representative short-term rates their own discount rate. The, huh. so the, the premium credit rate, which is by design, as you know, higher than yeah, it's the always seventy five percent higher than the target. At that, uh, you know, so basically they they were defining the meaning of short term interest rates so that they could have uh, the the uh, uh, they could have the interest rate on reserves above. All the rates most normal human beings would consider market short-term <laughs> interest rates and still be meeting the requirements of the statute, particularly because it would be impossible, it'd be literally impossible for them to have the interest rate on reserves not be lower than the premium credit rate because their their other uh, their their operating procedure still calls for the discount or premium credit rate to be seventy-five basis yep. points above target. So they, they they meet the statute uh, legally only because they decided how they to change the, the meaning. Yes. Congress should do something about that. And said, well, hasn't Congress called them out on that? Well, they've questioned them about it, and Janet yes. Yellen more or less, you know, did one of these hand waving things. But it's absurd. Uh, it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. If you if you read if you're you know if you're an economist and you don't know that uh, the uh, Fed's primary credit rate is not representative of the general level of short-term interest rates, then uh, you You're need not to a- have your <laughs> license to <laughs> teach economics taken away. So they've cheated. They've cheated. They've, they've you know, they, but this is, this is frankly, you know, this is a problem with the way we let statutes be in, enforced by letting the, the agency that's supposed to be regulated interpret the statute and you know, now it's in the con- it's in the the civil code that this is this is what this means and they and the fed wrote it so they wrote it to satisfy their own uh, okay. wishes now congress can and should fix that if it's serious about the original law's intent uh, and there's some talk of trying to do something about it, and I've been urging them to. There are plenty of very nice representative rates. I've recommended the Federal Reserve Bank of New York has developed uh, uh, an index of private repo rates, treasury collateralized. So these are these are low risk, obviously, and they're overnight. That's pretty close. You want something that's a market rate that's comparable in risk and maturity to – Reserves. And that would be a good one. Okay. Uh, so that may at some point happen. I have to wait and see. It'll be the end of the floor system. It'll be the end of the floor it. system. And, it, and again, everything we've talked about, though, it is this isn't something to be feared or some, you know, cataclysmic change. It would still, again, entail keeping interest on excess reserves. You'd still get interest rate control. You'd still get some, you know, fixed to the implicit tax on reserves. But let's go on to the second legality issues. The first one you mentioned is the Fed's not actually following the true intent, original meaning of the law. That's right. Uh, the second one, though, is the way that interest on excess reserves is implemented. It effectively moves power from the FOMC to the Board of Governors. At least on paper, it hasn't been exercised that way. But to talk about that, it's hard to tell because uh, you know the the board of governors has a majority vote on the FOMC, and then they 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 work very hard to try to yes you know uh, uh, have their way uh, 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 anyway. They like uh, they like they don't like dissent. I know that, but here it now uh, with the twist is that it's literally the case that the most important policy rate setting. Is the legal responsibility <clears throat> legal responsibility of the board only, 
And uh, and that means that you could conceivably have a circumstance where several of the uh, uh, bank presidents uh, vote for uh, 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 vote for a different right setting than uh, the uh, board wants, and uh, and uh, because they and even though uh, uh, there's some and you have some people on the board who are dissenting with the other board members, you could conceivably have a situation where a majority of the FOMC favors rate X, but a majority of the board favors rate Y, and the, the board would not have to uh, 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 go along with the majority of the FOMC in the current legal situation. That's a pretty striking observation that at the end of the day, the mm-hmm. board can overrule the FOMC if it needed to. In terms of setting the interest on excess reserves rate, and, and, and yes, it could happen. Uh, it's not highly likely, but it could happen. It could happen, though. And remember, when the the law was originally designed, it was not thought it was not a st- uh, the interest on excess reserves was not conceived as something that would be used as in, as a policy tool. Uh, let alone the Fed's most important yep. policy rate t- tool. Uh, that was not. Uh, what was planned or intended. So under the circumstances, given the limited purpose of interest on reserves at the time, it didn't, it wasn't uh, inconsistent with the general way monetary policy has been conducted for the right to set that, the responsibility for setting that rate to be placed with the board rather than with the FOMC. But now that uh, interest on reserves has become the chief mechanism or instrument of monetary control, it's the fact that the FOMC isn't allowed to be as fully responsible for it as it is responsible for, say, open market operations is uh, 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 something of, a, uh, <laughs> of an anomaly in the, in the present Fed setup, assuming that we agree that the way things had evolved, evolved with the FOMC being the, the group responsible for conducting and steering monetary policy, if we believe that, then we have to believe that something's gone wrong. Yes, and so there could be some scenario in the future where maybe – a crisis emerges where you need someone to act quickly. And so we huddle together a few board members to make the decision and they cut the rate without consulting the entirety. And this reminds me of a story from Mike Bologno in a paper he tells of Alan Greenspan. So this might sound like this is an academic concern, an academic debate. But Mike Bologno tells the story of Alan Greenspan when he was the chairman of the Fed, that there was an, an occasion where the FOMC voted for a change in the federal funds rate target that he didn't want. And he went around their backs using a very similar technique. He went and got the board to change the discount rate. and which, because which it has control over. Right, so the board has control over like it does the interest and excess reserve. So Greenspan got the board to move the discount rate. And by default, the federal fund rate had to follow that move because there's a certain spread between the two. And that's a real-world example of where, you know, a determined chair or something comes up where a board, you know, governor or a group of them decide to make a rate cut independent of what the FOMC has voted. So yeah. there's a real world application. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Bernanke has written about this issue saying, oh, you know, this is not really important. You know, that we have these long traditions and we're, we're, we're just going to follow the tradition, even though the law has technically changed. To which my response is, well, you know, if the Fed was, if, 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 if is he, does he really think that we should be confident that the Fed's going to stick to all its old traditions? Because it it seemed to be that that it's changed a lot of its traditions in the last ten years. Yeah. Right. So since so, what basis do we have for being confident that the Fed wouldn't make an innovation here as well? They've been innovating like right. mad. It's not like tradi- they're, it's not like they're a bunch of tradition bound. <laughs> I mean, interest and excess reserves. We've <laughs> you know, been talking about it is a big innovation. Yeah, it wasn't right. meant to be the they main innovated that interest so. rate, but it is now the main interest yeah, rate. Yeah. So no, you can't just and it's a, you know that's why we have laws, right? That's why we have rules. So we want things to be done according to the way we think they ought to be done, not not leave it to people to just do the right thing. We've got too much of that in monetary policy as it is. Yes. So going forward, do you think this conversation about interest and excess reserves will continue? Do you, are there people who share your interest in revisiting this issue? So I, I keep running tabs on how many people are sh- concerned about this. 
it's very easy because <laughs> there aren't <laughs> enough of them. But there are, you know, I, I think there's at least a dozen now, which is which is good. <laughs> uh-huh. um, and um, uh, there may be more I, I don't know about, but I sure hope uh, to do what I can to keep the conversation going because I think this is a big issue. I don't want us to find out in the next crisis what the shortcomings of this operating system are. And uh, and I, I do think it's on the on the uh, uh, side of a, a sufficient expansion that its shortcomings are most clear. It, it's very good at keeping things tight. It is a doubtful system for making sure they're not too tight. And that's, that's why I, you know, I'm not worried about it causing inflation. I'm not call, worried about it uh, causing booms. I'm worried mm-hmm. about uh, the opposites. Okay. Well, our time is up. Our guest today has been George Selgin. George, thanks once again for coming on the show. You're very welcome, David. Thank you for having me. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.